Hi, I'm Sydney Heggy, the student pharmacist, and I'll be talking to you about Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson is a 58-year-old white male who presented to the hospital via ambulance, and his chief complaint was extreme shortness of breath and chest pain, described as a burning sensation radiating into his neck and down his left arm. HS reports continuing to smoke despite being told by his doctor to stop, and HS was also previously admitted to the hospital four months ago for a provoked DVT following a 10-hour plane ride. He reports no new issues related to this event. Simpson has a past medical history significant for a provoked DVT four months ago for which he takes a Pixaban 5 milligram oral tablet twice daily, hyperlipidemia for which he takes resuvastatin 5 milligram oral tablet daily, and hypertension for which he takes lisinopril 5 milligram oral tablet daily. In terms of his social history, he is an active smoker admitting to half a pack per day and occasional alcohol use. For family history, his mother has a past medical history of migraines, his sister has a history of hypertension, and his father passed away from an MI 10 years ago. He, in terms of allergies, he has no known allergies. For Homer's assessment and plan, his primary problem is a new STEMI ACS cardiovascular event. Homer's symptoms are commonly associated with acute coronary syndrome, ACS, STEMI, including shortness of breath and chest pain radiating down his left arm. Upon arrival, his blood pressure was 150 over 90 and heart rate of 102 beats per minute. Important labs were obtained, including, obtained, including a CBC panel with a low amount of hemoglobin and low hematocrit, and a BMP panel indicating creatinine level of 1.5. A co coagulation test showed a normal INR level of 1.1 and normal PTT. Cardiac labs indicated an elevated troponin level that was 6.25 upon admission and increased to 10.3. Creatinine kinase was 3.0%, was which is a cardiac-specific enzyme. The patient's EKG displayed normal sinus rhythm with slight tachycardia and ST elevations. A chest x-ray indicated no active pulmonary embolism. So this combo of cardiac labs, ST elevations present on the EKG, and administration of an oral GI cocktail helped diagnose Simpson's cardiovascular event as a STEMI. He was then transferred to the cath lab for an emergent PCI and the placement of a drug-eluting stent. Um, after catheterization with a drug-eluting stent, medical therapy needs to be optimized. So a P2Y12 inhibitor loading dose of ticagrelor 180 milligrams, so 90 tablets, 90 milligram tablets and two of those was given to HS prior to transfer to the cath lab. The providers would like to recommend a dose of 325 oral aspirin once daily, but we would recommend aspirin 81 milligram instead. This is based on evidence from the current OASIS 7 2010 trial that found an increased rate of minor bleeding with higher aspirin doses. We would also recommend dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin 81 milligram once daily and and P2Y12 inhibitor ticagrelor 90 milligram oral tablet twice daily. The ticagrelor would be continued for 12 months. This is based on the Pegasus Timmy 54 trial, which provided results of ticagrelor use post MI. We would also recommend increasing his restuvastatin dose from 5 milligram to a high intensity dose of 20 milligram once daily. This is provided. This is based on the Prove It Timmy 22 trial and the AHA ACC 2013 guidelines that provide benefit of high intensity statins in post MI. We would also recommend an oral beta blocker to be administered within the first 24 hours for, great, for the greatest benefit. Initiation of Carvedilol 6.25 mg twice a day oral tablet with food would be beneficial for HS. This is based on evidence from the AHA. AHA 2013 guidelines, and the ISIS-1 trial that provides evidence of early beta blocker use post-MI. A rapid-acting nitrate such as nitroglycerin 0.4 mg sublingual tablets should be prescribed as needed for chest pain, and the patient should be counseled on the appropriate use. These recommended medications are supported by the 2013 ACCH, ACCF AHA guidelines for management of STEMIs. In terms of important labs, we will continue to monitor INR, signs and symptoms of bleeding, and CBC. For his second problem being hypertension, his blood pressure during hospitalization ranged from 150 over 95 to 133 over 90 to 155 over 98, currently uncontrolled and demonstrating stage 2 hypertension. He was continued on his lisinopril 5 milligram oral tablet from home while admitted, but based on his blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80 and his ASCVD risk being greater than 10, his ASCVD risk is 26.8, 
From the 2017 AHA ACC blood pressure guidelines, we would recommend increasing his lisinopril to 10 mg oral tablet daily for improved blood pressure control. The use of lisinopril and beta blocker will act as antihypertensive agents. Um, his potassium ranged from 4.5 to 4.3, and serum creatinine ranged from 1.5 to 1.7. Would continue to monitor his serum creatinine as well as potassium levels to prevent hyperkalemia and a large increase in serum, serum creatinine. Lifestyle modifications need to be discussed with the patient as well as initiating a cardiac diet, low salt, low fat, low cholesterol. Um, in one month, we need to assess the patient's blood pressure and review his at-home blood pressure logs. For his third problem is hyperlipidemia, Homer's lipid profile is uncontrolled with elevated triglycerides, LDL, and total cholesterol. He falls into statin group 1 for secondary prevention and elevated LDL. Based on his LDL goal of less than 70 in the AHA 2019 guidelines, a high-intensity statin dose will help achieve LDL lowering of 50% or more. His 10-year ASCVD risk is 26.8%, so to control his lipid levels, we would recommend increasing his restuvastatin from 5 to 20 milligram once daily. This is a high-intensity statin dose. Um, we would counsel patients on symptoms of myalgia, even though this is dose-dependent, and he would need a lipid panel assessed in 4 to 12 weeks. For his fourth problem, obesity and tobacco smoking, the patient admits to continue smoking despite advice from his physician. His BMI is 31.9, and, and he is considered obese class 1, according to CDC and NIH guidelines. Weight loss will help lower his bleep, blood pressure and cholesterol levels, and we need to advise him that smoking status is also impacting his other comorbidities and to help set goals for smoking cessation. And finally, for his last problem, which is DVT prophylaxis, he has been taking a Pixaban 5 milligram oral tablet twice daily for treatment of his past provoked DVT four months ago. Based on the 2020 ACC expert consensus on antithrombotics and chest guidelines, a provoked DVT requires DOAC for a duration of three months. The patient has been treated for this DVT and should discontinue a Pixaban. But his past DVT warrants prophylaxis, so enoxaparin subcutaneous 40 milligram once daily should be administered for the length, of the, the length of the hospital stay until the patient is fully ambul ambulatory with no active embolism. When continuing IV heparin infusion, we would make sure that the PTT is therapeutic before administering this enoxaparin. We would continue to monitor serum creatinine, CBC, and also factor 10A. Um, we would monitor anti-factor 10A levels after the third dose, so after three days of using anoxaparin, we would check four hours after this last dose. He should follow up in one to two weeks after discharge, and this concludes the patient presentation. Thanks.